Praise God. Can I have you open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 15? This morning we want to continue looking at the series we've entitled, The Vine and the Branches. It comes out of John 15, primarily the first eight verses. Let me start by reading verse 1. I am the true vine, Jesus said. My Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Verse 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. Now, so far in this series, we have looked at the true vine, Jesus Christ. We have looked at the vine dresser, the Father. And starting last week, we began to look at the vine branches. And we started with what we're calling Judas branches. Judas branches. Verse 2 again. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. As we said last week, guys, this is the controversial part of this passage. Who are these branches that don't bear fruit and are cast out and burned? Now, you'll have to go in online and listen to the message from last week because we did develop this at length, and I think it's important enough to do that, to listen to it. But let me just say, before we move on, I don't believe the branches that don't bear fruit are speaking about Christians who don't bear fruit and who are eventually cut off from Christ and cast into hell. There's a lot of uh, teachers that believe that. There's a lot of teachers that believe if a person gets saved, they don't live at some level of uh, maturity, fruit-bearing, holiness, whatever you want to call it, that um, eventually God will get tired of putting up with them and He'll cut them off and they will eventually be cast into hell. I absolutely do not believe that is the interpretation of this passage. All right? I believe that these are not Christians who are eventually cast into hell because they don't bear enough fruit. Uh, but rather they are a reference to Judas and all who are like him. In other words, phony, counterfeit disciples. Folks that go to church. You don't think that churches across America are loaded with people that profess to know God, but do not, do not know him at all? That's why I'm calling this point Judas branches, the professors, the professors, because they profess to know God. Uh, hey, I'm saved. Well, how'd that happen? I was born a Christian. Oh, I see. Uh, that's always a red flag. If you're born a Christian, you're not a Christian, okay? Because nobody's born a Christian, all right? Uh, so, but, but there's a lot of folks who are harboring under that kind of delusion that I've always known God, you know, I'm an American, right? Americans, we all, we're all Christians. No, that's not true. Uh, and a lot of these folks go to church and, does, and, and are in church every week, some of them, but they're, they're counterfeit disciples, people who look genuine, but are only superficially connected to Jesus, like Judas. Everyone thought Judas was a real disciple. He was really saved. And we have talked about that. Uh, Jesus said he wasn't. We'll talk about that more in a second. So just hang on to that, okay? But, um, uh, but these are, are what some have called Judas branches. Uh, they're not really connected to Christ. In other words, they're not really born again. Yet they come to church and they call themselves Christians. So that brings us to what we want to talk about this morning. We saw the Judas branches last week. We want to look at the Jesus branches today. And... Um, Everything that Jesus has to say to those who are true believers in this passage is built around the concept of abiding in Christ. Very important concept, all right? Look at verse 4. Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. The word abide is a key word 
in John's writings. It occurs 11 times in this chapter alone, 40 times in John's gospel, and 27 times in his epistles. Very important concept. What is it? How do we define it? Well, uh, the Greek word is meno, meno, and it means to remain or to continue. What is the nature of this abiding in Christ? Because we want to define this pretty clearly, okay? Um, when it comes to abiding in Christ, there's, there's two sides to it. What I'm calling union and then communion. Uh, union with Jesus is the connection that comes when we put our faith in him, accepting him into our heart as our Lord and our Savior. Uh, this is a positional connection to Christ, which we commonly refer to as salvation. When I say this is a positional connection to Jesus, I am saying that it isn't subject to what we do or don't do in our Christian life. I believe once you're saved, you are saved eternally. If you're saved at all, you're saved forever. Only God knows the heart. It's a lot of folks who think they're saved. Now, Paul said, the firm foundation of the Lord stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. He knows the heart. We don't. Often our hearts deceive us, right? But I believe that if you, are, you have union with Christ, you're saved. That's a positional connection. And it isn't subject to what we do or don't do in the Christian life. I'm not advocating for living a lousy Christian life because you're saved forever. I'm not, that's not my point here. I'm just trying to, to save a lot of folks from the devil's condemnation. Uh, the devil would love you to think your salvation is not secure. The devil would love you to think that it depends on you every day to keep it. Try to live with any peace or joy like that. The devil wants to, get, to keep you under condemnation. And God wants to, to tell you that you're saved by grace. Grace means a gift, right? You, you all know that. It's a, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Again, grace means a gift. Something you receive by faith. You've been, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not the result, not, not of works, lest any should boast. Guys, again, since salvation is a gift we didn't earn, it is therefore something we cannot lose. And that is just flat out the way I believe the Bible is clearly teaching it, right? Um, it's a gift. We didn't have to earn it. We can't lose it because we don't measure up. We didn't measure up and we received it. So why should we lose it if we don't measure up? And we're all not going to measure up. We're all going to fail, right? What that should do is not bring condemnation into our lives. Oh, God hates me now. Uh, he's cast me out. I'm going to go to hell. No, it should be like, Lord, I need more grace. I need more of your grace to walk with you. And that's the idea. The more we draw close to God, the more he gives us the grace and strength to walk with him. Okay? Um, and I believe, guys, the 11 remaining disciples, remember now, Judas is out by this time uh, carrying out his betrayal of Christ. He's gone. And I believe the 11 remaining disciples that night had genuinely entered into union with Jesus, which he verifies in verse 3. Uh, talking to the eleven, you are already clean, in other words, cleansed from sin, saved, because of the word which I have spoken to you. You've received the gospel. I, I gave you the gospel, you received it. And I know you're saved, okay? But there was one disciple who wasn't clean, one who wasn't genuine, one who wasn't saved. Back up to verse, uh, excuse me, to chapter 13, when Judas was still in the upper room with them. John 13, starting with verse 10. Let's go into the middle of verse 10. Where he said to the disciples, And you are clean. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. You're not all saved. He was talking about Judas. Okay, he made that very clear as we studied that passage. So in, re in that regard, these disciples had already entered into a positional abiding in Christ, or in other words, they were genuinely saved. First comes salvation, union with Christ, and then comes communion with Christ. An unbeliever can't have communion with Christ, all right? Uh, only a saved person can have communion. 
with Jesus Christ. All right, um, and that's what we want to look at, uh, at right now. The whole point of salvation is to glorify God by bearing fruit. Look at verse eight again. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. And the idea is so you will prove yourself to be my disciples. Uh, bearing fruit doesn't save you. Uh, it just proves that you're a Christian. All right. Uh, and that's the idea. But bearing fruit, which is what is the, uh, is the uh, focus of the chapter, something the Father is actively promoting by pruning our lives in different ways, that we bear fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. But that won't happen. We're not going to bear fruit as Christians unless we stay in a perpetual state of connectedness to Jesus. We call this communion or fellowship. Guys, this is a practical connection to Jesus. Listen, that is dependent on what we do or what we don't do in our Christian lives. Of course, sin is the thing that really severs our practical fellowship with Jesus. It doesn't cause us to lose our salvation but it does sever our practical fellowship with the Lord, right? And we're talking about sins of commission and also sins of omission. What does that mean? Sins of commission are sins that you commit against what God has said. God says, you shall not steal, thou shalt not steal. You go ahead and steal something, you've just broken that commandment, and you're guilty of a sin of commission. You willfully did it. If you're checking out somewhere, uh, from a store and the uh, the clerk behind the counter gives you too much change and you don't say anything because after all you didn't really steal it he gave it to you or she gave it to you and so you don't say anything about it and walk out of the store that's also a sin it's the sin of omission okay i mean the sin of commission is doing what is wrong the sin of omission is not doing what is right and there's so a lot of Christians, of course, uh, stay away from sins of commission. I mean, they know what the word says, and they're not going to break the commandments as, as much as possible. We're not; none of us are perfect, right? Um, but if something happens where somebody, like in our illustration, gives you too much change, and you don't say, "Hey, you made a mistake. Here's, you know, here's here's some money back. You gave me too much," and you walk out of the store. In God's eyes, you have stolen that money, right? Or if you uh, are at work and you're uh, working with a team of people on a project, we'll say, and one of the people really put in most of the effort, but the boss thinks it was you. And so he or she takes you on the side and really praises you for doing a great job on this project. And you know, there might be a promotion in the future for you because of the great job you did. You know you didn't do most of the work. But if you don't, Tell the boss that and just accept that praise and maybe even eventually get that promotion that you didn't deserve somebody else did. That is a sin. It's a sin of omission. So just so we understand it, right? Um, if we stay in communion with Jesus, in other words, in unbroken daily fellowship, we will never, if we don't stay in fellowship with him, we'll never bear fruit, which is, again, the ultimate goal of our Christianity. When Christians don't abide, when they don't abide or they don't maintain practical fellowship with Jesus, look, again, they don't lose their salvation, but they do lose their victory over the flesh. They do lose the spiritual dynamic that at one time characterized their Christian life, and they do lose any fruit of the Spirit that was growing in their life. And then they eventually begin to lose their witness, their opportunities to serve God, and ultimately their rewards in heaven unless they repent and get right with God. But their salvation is secure because it is a free gift of God's grace, not a result of works, lest any should boast, right? So the whole idea of abiding is very important, okay? And it really dominates John's writings, but I think the entire New Testament. Um, let's look at the practice of abiding, the practice of abiding. Um, when it comes to the practice of abiding, uh, uh, on a daily basis, two schools of thought have developed, two approaches that try to address this important issue, and it is important, the pacifist approach and the activist approach. What are they? Well, those in the pacifist camp say that the way to abide in Christ on a daily basis is to do nothing, to do nothing. 
but simply yield to God and let him do all the work. Because if you try to do something, you're getting in the flesh, you're trying to do something in the work or the energy of your flesh, you're going to just torpedo everything. Best you just submit. And the reasoning goes like this. Christ lives in you, they say, and wants to use, the way, wants to use you the way a hand uses a glove. All the glove has to do is surrender, right? Submit. And that's your job, just to submit, do nothing. The activist approach in this camp respond by saying, look, we're not dead gloves. We have a responsibility to put the effort into our walk and to do the things God has commanded us to do. Yes, we must yield to God. Yes, we must submit. But he won't force us to do the things he's commanding us to do. That has to be an act of our free will. So who's right? Well, I think both, really. Both have captured an element of truth with regard to this subject. Um, abiding is not a passive thing, like a glove on a hand, because, listen, a glove doesn't have an intellect, doesn't have a free will, right? Uh, a glove can't rebel. All a glove can do is submit. So that's not really the best illustration. Now, uh, I have used uh, uh, God using us like a hand and a glove in other illustrations and other contexts. It does apply to some things, but not here, not here. The idea that we prosper and blossom and bear the most fruit possible by just being submissive and doing nothing ourselves, uh, I think is definitely misguided. On the other hand, no pun intended, abiding is not such an active thing on our part that we do everything and God does nothing. Look at verse, uh, verse 5 of John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For listen, without me you can do nothing. So to ever say in our Christian life that we do everything and basically God does nothing is ridiculous. So what is it? Well, I think Paul struck the balance on this subject when he admonished us as believers in Philippians 2, verses 12 to 13. He said, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Paul is saying that God works in and we work out. What does that mean? Well, it means that God has a part and we have a part. God won't do our part and we can't do his part. God doesn't need us for anything. But the way he's designed us and our walk with him is that we all have a responsibility to do certain things. He won't do those things for us. He won't make us do these things. He won't wake us up, levitate us out of our bed and float us into the front room and put a Bible in our hands and say, okay, now do your devotions. That has to be something we purpose to do. Yes, by his grace and strength, I'm not saying it's all us. I'm just saying, though, that God is a part in our Christian life, and we have a part. That's the balance. And again, God's not going to do our part. We can't do his part. It's very important that we understand that. As we surrender, God works in us. And then as we obey, God works out from our lives his will and purposes. But practically speaking, there are things we must do if we're going to continue abiding in Christ every day or else listen. The New Testament writers, and right now I'm thinking of Paul, would never admonish us to abide in Christ if it was automatic. Once we got saved and God was doing everything, right? I mean, there's something called Christian perfectionism. It's a heresy, but it's out there. Once you get saved, you're perfect. You never sin anymore. I'd like to be a fly on, on the ceiling of their car on the expressway, Okay. <laughs> Um, but we're perfect, you know. We we don't, you know, we don't have to do anything really good because we're we're immune from sin. Well, if that was the case, why is so much of the New Testament filled with exhortations not to sin, to walk in the Spirit, uh, so on and so forth? Right? If it was automatic and I had no part in it, which is ridiculous. Of course, I have a part in it. I still have a free will. I had a free will when I was a, a, an unbeliever. Once I got saved, God didn't take that away from me. I still have that free will, and I want to exercise it 
in obedience to God. All right, we're looking, though, at practic- the practice of abiding. And uh, I'm going to give you four things. Now, these are very deep and profound. And I'm sure that when we're done, you're going to really thank the Lord you have me to explain them to you. All right? I'm just saying. First one is prayer. Prayer. Now, listen. When I think of prayer, I don't think of a monologue. I think of a dialogue. A lot of pastors and teachers would be beside themselves with anger uh, to hear somebody say that because they believe that God does not speak to our hearts individually. Everything God has, is going to say, he has said in the pages of Scripture. And I believe that doctrinally. I don't believe God's speaking to us individually, giving us new doctrine. Although some groups say that he is, they're wrong. Every, the canon of Scripture is closed. Uh, with John writing the book of Revelation, which 95 A.D. closed the canon of Scripture. That is inspired doctrine, and we have it all we need. That doesn't mean that God doesn't any longer talk to us, though, personally, directing our lives, uh, you know, and and speaking to us in various ways personally. Of course he does. Uh, I totally believe this, and that's why I believe, and I believe the Bible teaches this very clearly, that... um, when you pray to God, uh, it's not a, a monologue, it's a dialogue. And if you allow God to speak to your heart as you're praying to him, giving him time to maybe answer, uh, of course the devil will try to get in there. So you always judge everything God says by his word because he's never going to deny his word or contradict his word, right? But it's important that we understand this, that... Um, you can't have communion with Jesus without prayer. Any more than you could have communion with your spouse without communication. Uh, I was listening to a, a, a Christian uh, marriage counselor years ago. I was doing a series on marriage and um, listening to this gentleman. And he said, in my practice, 90% of the problems that ma- uh, couples have in their marriage is a lack of communication. They're talking maybe at each other, but not to each other, right? And often not with each other. They're just talking or not talking at all. It's a uh, Cold War, okay? Uh, nobody's saying much of anything. You can't have a strong, healthy marriage without communication any more than you can have a strong walk with the Lord without prayer, without spiritual communication. Very important. The second way we abide in Christ is by staying in the Word, staying in the Word of God. John 8, verse 31, Jesus said, If you abide in me, excuse me, he said, If you abide, in other words, continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Jesus is here telling us that continuing in the word is the same as abiding in him. Well, he is the word. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? So Jesus is the word. And if you continue in the Word of God, daily devotions, reading God's Word every day, you are basically abiding in Christ. I will have you turn to 1 John chapter 2. In 1 John chapter 2, let's start with verse 3. Where John said, now, by this we know that we know him. This is how we know we're saved, is basically what he's saying. If we keep his commandments. Now, none of us do it perfectly. But if the general pattern of your life is to keep God's commandments, and once in a while you sin, that's a good indication you're a child of God. Because before I got saved, the general pattern of my life was to sin, and once in a while do some good stuff. That's the difference, right? We flip that over. But here, here's a litmus test, John is saying, by how we can know that we know him. Uh, are you keeping his commandments in a regular, on a regular basis? Verse 4, he who says, well, I know him, I've always been a Christian, and does not keep his commandments, does not live habitually in a, in a state of obedience to God, is a liar. Do you get that? He who does not keep God's command, commandments habitually, consistently, is a liar when they think they're a Christian. The truth is not in him or her. Verse 5, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. 
By this we know that we are, listen, in him or that we are abiding. By this we know that we are abiding in him. That we're keeping his commandments. Jump down to verse 24. Therefore let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And what John is saying is if you uh, continue to feed on God's word every day, if you continue to walk in that truth, uh, it tells us that, you know, you're genuine uh, if you continue in it. Now, even false disciples come to church and keep the word of God for a time. But eventually, like Judas, they split. They leave. They don't continue. They don't remain is the idea, right? But if you are somebody who's been a Christian for a while, and you're still loving the word, you're still reading the word, you're still praying that God gives you grace to obey the word, that is a wonderful litmus test that you're saved. And you're abiding in Christ as you stay in the word. You know, Andrew Murray, in his classic work, Abide in Christ, which I've decided to make the book of this quarter. It's such an important book, okay, because it's such an important subject. But Andrew Murray had this to say on the subject, and I quote. He said, The more I think of and pray about the religious situation in our country, the deeper my conviction becomes that Christians do not realize that the aim of conversion is to bring them daily into fellowship, communion with the Father in heaven. For the believer, taking time each day with God's word and in prayer is indispensable. Each day we need to wait upon God for his presence and his love to be revealed. It is not enough at conversion to accept forgiveness of sins or even uh, to surrender to God. Uh, That is only the beginning. And I've underlined this next verse. We must understand that we have no power on our own to maintain our spiritual life. This is where a lot of Christians miss it. I did for many years. We don't walk with this is a Christian life is a supernatural life. You will never live it uh, and definitely never grow fruit through it by hard work and determination. When it comes to living the life God wants us to live, making God promises that you fully intend to keep like Peter, though these deny you, I will never deny you. You might have good intentions, but you're putting faith in the flesh, in the strength of your flesh, and it's not going to help you. It's a self-defeating proposition. You can't use the flesh to conquer the flesh. You have to rely on the Holy Spirit to conquer the flesh, right? Your fallen nature, that thing inside of us that wants to rebel against God and violate His commandments and do our own thing, right? There's no way we're going to say to God, Lord, okay, I realize I've been blowing it lately, but Lord... Hang in there and watch me go. I'm going to really try harder now. That's okay. Well, go right ahead. Uh, when you're ready, we'll, we'll talk. Okay? And you, you fall on your face enough times, you begin to wonder, am I going about this right? And, and so well, that's what we need to understand. This is what Murray is talking about. Uh, he went on to say, we need to receive daily new grace from heaven through fellowship with the Lord Jesus. This cannot be obtained by a hasty prayer or a superficial reading of a few verses from God's word. We must take time to come into God's presence, to feel our weakness and our need, and to wait on God through his Holy Spirit to renew our fellowship with him. Then we may expect to be kept by the power of Christ throughout the day. It is my aim to help Christians to see the absolute necessity of spending time with the Lord Jesus. Without this, the joy and power of God's Holy Spirit in daily life cannot be experienced, end quote. And folks, there it is right there. There it is right there, okay? Our Christian life is going to blossom and be fruitful and wonderful for God's glory based on how much we put into it. That's all there is to it. People who think... You know, uh, I get up and read a couple verses and I pray before meals and bedtime. I'm good with God. Well, you're deceiving yourself. You're deceiving yourself. And that's why we need to be careful. Because, you know, as much effort as you put into your walk with God will be as much blessing as you're going to get back. Uh, Right? I mean, you can't live your Christian life on autopilot and expect to be a dynamic uh, Christian for God's glory just doesn't work like that all right 
So prayer, obviously, very important. Uh, staying in the Word of God, also very important. The third one is confession. How do, we, how do we keep abiding in Christ? Well, confession is very important. Uh, sin severs our communion with God, our practical connection with Jesus. But confession reconnects us to God. Very important. 1 John 1 verse 9, right? You all know it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the implication being is, if we have sinned and we confess it, we're out of fellowship with the Lord. Our fellowship isn't broken. But if we will confess our sins, our fellowship with Jesus will be restored, right? It all hinges on the concept of confession. What does that mean? Well, the Greek word simply means to say the same thing. To say the same thing. When we sin, we can either come to God and make excuses for ourselves, or we can blame somebody else for what we did, or we can own it. We can take responsibility. Too many Christians, you know, when they come to God and they've done something wrong, they say, well, they make excuses. It wasn't really my fault, Lord. They did this and I couldn't help myself. Or, uh, you know, they're blaming somebody else they, and so on. And they walk away thinking, well, because they you know, dumped on somebody else or didn't take responsibility, that they're good with God. Not true. True confession, the kind that God accepts and forgives our sins over, is to say the same thing. God, I broke your word. I broke your law. I knew it was wrong. I did it anyway. I'm not going to make any excuses, Lord. It was my, I did it. And I'm saying the same thing. You said it was wrong. I know it was wrong. And now, Lord, I'm asking you to forgive me. And that is the kind of confession God says you will never be turned away uh, you know, if you come to him with that kind of confession. That, that's a heart that really understands what's going on, a heart that says, God, I'm guilty. I did it. Uh, I know your word says it was wrong. I did it anyways. I say the same thing as you, Lord. It was sin. Please forgive me. And, Jesus, and John says, you will never be turned away. You will always be forgiven. And your fellowship with God will be restored. I'll give you one more. Obedience. And then we, we kind of touched on this already, all right? But a life of obedience is absolutely essential to maintaining your communion with Jesus Christ. Because, again, sin severs our fellowship with God. You all know Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, where it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither uh, his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. And Israel was confused as to why they're praying and confessing their sins, and God wasn't forgiving them. Their enemies were still attacking. Uh, all kinds of other negative consequences were, were taking place, and they couldn't get it. And so the prophet says to the people, the reason... You are still, you know, still enduring, uh, you know, consequences. It's because you haven't really drawn close to the Lord and, and, and confessed your sin, really. Uh, it's not that the Lord can't hear your prayer. It's not that he's too weak. His hand is too short to actually deliver you from your enemies. But you have separated yourself from God. You need to get on your face before God, confess your sin, say the same thing, and uh, repent, and he will forgive you. 1 John 1, 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him, with the Lord, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. You can't abide in Christ when you're living in sin. Over the years, I've heard people who call themselves Christians, but they're living together. And you call them on it. You know, and, oh, we love the Lord. But, yeah, but you're living together. Oh, well, yeah, but that's, we love each other. You know, we're going to get married eventually, you know. Well, you're not married now. And you know what? If you think you're walking in the light, if you think you're a Christian, and you're living this way, you're deceiving yourself. That's what the Word of God tells us. No, it's not that God can't forgive you or won't forgive you, but let's get your life right with God, right? Let's not make excuses. Oh, but we love each other. Well, God doesn't, you know, that excuse doesn't fly with the Lord. Uh, you're not married. When you get married, you live together. That's how it works. Today it's backwards, right? People have sex first, maybe move in secondly, and finally maybe they get married. Uh, look at us, aren't we? We're married. 
Yeah, after 15 years of living together. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, it, if you repent, God can, will forgive you. But let's not justify this, right? But 1 John 2, 6, give you one more. He who says he abides in him, abides is saved in, you know, in Christ, ought himself also to walk as he walked. So if you really think you're a Christian, you should be walking as Jesus walked. Because if you're not, well, you better take inventory of your heart because something's wrong, right? All right, so under the third sub-point, the practice of abiding, we have seen the outward actions, prayer, the word of God, confession of sin, obedience, right? Those were the outward actions to keep us walking in fellowship with the Lord, practically. Next, I want to end with this one. The inward attitude. Outward actions, okay, but how about the inward attitude? We often make the mistake of thinking that outward actions like, you know, reading our Bibles, going to church, praying, and serving God will result in our abiding in Him. And certainly these things are important. We just talked about them. Certainly these things are necessary if we want to keep abiding in Christ, as we have already said. But listen. It all gets down into motives then. Motives. This is a crucial thing that a lot of people, because they focus on the outward actions, they don't really look at the inward attitudes. Sure, going to church, reading your Bible, serving the Lord, sharing the faith, that's wonderful if it's all motivated from love for the Lord, right? Look, when a parent tells their child to clean their room, if the child obeys... Does their obedience automatically demonstrate their love for that parent? Not necessarily. Their obedience could be motivated by a fear of consequences. If they don't clean the room, right? Or by a promise of some kind of reward. You clean your room, I'll take you out for ice cream. Okay, I want ice cream. I'll clean my room. In other words, their obedience could be totally rooted in self-interest and have nothing to do with loving their parent at all. The same is true with our obedience to and service for God. These things might not be motivated by a sincere love for Jesus, but by a love of self. Um, there are a lot of people who want to get involved in ministry because they like the recognition. They like it when people see that they are in ministry. It makes them feel very spiritual. Years ago, I had a guy tell me that his wife wanted to teach in our Sunday school program. And the reason he gave was because it will, it will boost her self-esteem. And I said, we don't put people in ministry to boost their self-esteem. We put people in ministry that understand it's about Jesus, loving Christ, uh, and serving him. Really, I'm irrelevant what it does for me. Oftentimes, it will bring some kind of persecution. You serve God for any length of time, somebody's going to turn against you. But that's not the issue. It's not me. It's, it's about Jesus, right? Um, it's all about love. Here, abiding is all about love. A deep, a deep love relationship with Jesus, which leads to obeying and serving him out of love. Look at John 15, verse 9 and 10. Where Jesus said, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. When we are in love with Jesus, we will want to read our Bibles. We'll want to pray. We'll want to go to church and tell others about him. Our love for him Will be, the mo will be the motivation for all that we do for him. But it's possible to be obedient to what God has said and even be serving him in ministry and listen, still not be very close to him if your heart has grown cold. So how is that possible? It's possible. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. Because this happened with one church in Asia Minor. The church of Ephesus, right? I mean, this letter that Jesus dictated to this church, there were seven in total. 
But the letter he dictated to the church uh, in Ephesus uh, is an incredible uh, letter to show us that you can be serving the Lord to the point of exhaustion and him not even acknowledge it if it's not done out of love. Look at verse 2. Jesus said to this church, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them to be liars. And you have per uh, uh, persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. The Greek is they were, they were working to the point of exhaustion, but they kept going, serving the Lord, right? Here's the word that should strike, you know, fear into our hearts. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. The Greek is honeymoon love, passionate love, okay? The church of Ephesus fell into the trap of thinking that loveless service was enough to please the Lord. Loveless service was enough to please the Lord. Well, let me ask you this. What if your wife came to you one day and she said to you, I don't love you anymore. I have absolutely no feelings at all for you, but I'm going to stay married to you. I'm going to clean your house. I'm going to wash your clothes. I'm going to cook your meals. What husband would be happy with that relationship, with a relationship with their spouse like that? I mean, I didn't marry, I didn't marry my wife so that I would have somebody to cook my meals and clean my house. I could hire a maid to do those things. I married Cindy because I fell in love with her and she fell in love with me. And now all the acts of service that she does for me, and they are many, are special and beautiful because, because I know that they are an expression of her love for me. Without the love, though, they'd be meaningless. They'd be meaningless. It's obvious that Jesus feels the same way and wants more than just service in our relationship with him. He wants passionate honeymoon love he's our bridegroom right remember he is holding his church in his loving arms with his nail scarred hands which is the ultimate act of selfless love to lay down your life for those that you love let me just ask you this as we bring this to a close and i've asked myself this i'm just not talking to you guys what kind of love are you giving him in return? I mean, he gave his life for us. That's the ultimate act of sacrificial love. How are we responding? What kind of love are we giving Jesus in return? Look, all Christians love Jesus. Not all Christians are in love with Jesus. And there is a difference, right? I mean, when was the last time you told the Lord, Lord, I love you? And it wasn't connected to a prayer request, something you wanted, right? I mean, yeah, how many people say, well, Lord, I love you. But they're really wanting something from the Lord, right? When they don't need something from the Lord, they typically don't show up too much to be in his presence. Um, you know, this, this is, this is um, shows itself in many marriages today. Many, many marriages have so deteriorated that the words, I love you, are only used when couples want something from each other. In Jesus' letter to the church of Ephesus, he goes on to tell them what they needed to do to get back to that first love or that honeymoon love in their relationship with him, how they could get back to abiding in him on a practical level, right? Uh, verse 5, Revelation 2. He said, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Just quickly, first love, can be that's honeymoon love again. First love can be restored if we follow the three instructions Jesus gave us. First of all, we must remember the love we used to have for him and cultivate a desire to regain uh, that close communion with him once again. You got to remember, if, if you're ever going to go back to something, a better time than what you're experiencing right now, you've got to remember how it was in the past, right? Look, don't let the, the, the new normal mindset creep into your heart, right? 
What does that mean? They're trying to get us to think that how life was before COVID is over. It's over. This is the new normal. You're saying that? They want you to get used to this. Uh, the blatant power grab that they uh, leveled upon all of us, uh, I'm thinking blue state governors and mayors primarily, they're not willing to let go of that. That's where they're talking about this is the new normal. They want to keep this power. They want power over your life. They want you to think that this is uh, the normal now. Sometimes as Christians, we allow the devil to tell us that. We have been languishing in a mediocre walk for so long, after a while, we tell ourselves, this is normal. And then we see somebody who's on fire for the Lord, who's always talking about Jesus, to people about Jesus, we think they're the fanatic. Why? Because I'm normal. We always make ourselves feel normal, right? We're the norm. They're the, they're the extreme. They're the fanatic. This is the problem. A lot of Christians have walked so long in their Christian life in a mediocre, mediocre way, they really believe that this is normal Christianity. And that's why Jesus said, you got to remember how it once was. Don't look at your life now. Remember how it was when you first loved me and were saved. Secondly, after you remember how it was, repent. Repent which means to turn around and forsake, listen, any relationship with anyone or anything that is competing in our heart for the love that belongs to Jesus. You fill in the blank, okay? It's a lot of things that have entered our hearts that are competing with our love for Jesus. He won't compete. He wants to be your first love, your only love. You say, I can't love my wife or my kids or my husband no no but what i'm saying and what i told first service is if you really put the lord first and love him supremely every other relationship in your life will be you'll love them properly i can't really love people properly if i put them above the lord that's not noble you know well, i love my wife and kids first they're super then i love god it's close second but i you know no you're, you're not going to really love your, your wife, your husband, your kids properly if you don't put the Lord first. Because that's what, when selfless love manifests itself. And that's when you're putting them first, not yourself. You, you can't do it unless you repent of loving anything. And it could be a thing, right? It could be a boat or a motorcycle or a, or a sports car or something, right? Something. You got to put the Lord first above all things. So remember, repent, and then repeat. Do your first works, right? Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do your first works. That's why I'm saying. Remember, repent, and repeat. Well, what does that mean, Pastor? Repeat what? What were you doing when you first got saved? You were really in love with the Lord. You were on fire, right? You were in your honeymoon phase of your walk. What were you doing uh, when you first got saved? Well, you, some would say, well, uh, I was going to church on a regular basis. Okay, go again. Go again. Others would say I was getting up early for morning devotions. Do it again. Some would say I sang praise to the Lord as I walked through my day. I was always singing praise. Sing again. Remember, repent, and repeat is the key to restoring your relationship with Jesus. You know, the passion of Paul the Apostle's life was that I might know him. You know, when Paul said that in Philippians 3, he had already been a Christian for 30 years. And yet Paul said, I want to know him more and more every day. I want to know him more deeply uh, every day. I want to know him in a more intimate way. Um, and that doesn't happen, you know, in a, in a couple of weeks. I think it's an ongoing thing. I think throughout all eternity, we're going to love Jesus more and more. So let me end by saying this. The question that you, and I have asked myself this too, it's not just about you guys. The question you need to ask yourself is, what is the state of my love for Jesus? 
not what is the state of your theology about Jesus or the state of your service to Jesus. What is the state of your love for Jesus? And if your heart has grown cold in your relationship with him, ask him to light the fire of passionate love once again. I'm not saying we do everything, God does nothing. I'm saying, yeah, remember, uh, remember, um, repent and repeat. But I'm not saying we do that apart from asking the Lord, please, Lord. I realize now my walk is not what it, I thought it was normal. It's not where it should be. Lord, would you pour your spirit upon me? Would you, Lord, work within me um, that I might know you, that that passion would be rekindled? that I once had, right? That I might fall in love with you once again. You're my bridegroom. I want to fall in love with you. Guys, it's not too late to rekindle that honeymoon love. It's not too late to really start abiding in Jesus in a close, intimate fellowship and communion with him because, guys, listen, that is the secret of bearing much fruit. And that's what we're talking about, right? It's all about loving Jesus. The more you love him, the more you want to stay close to him. The more you stay close to him, the more you'll bear fruit. It's all about loving him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So next week, I think we will finish this series. Hallelujah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm inundated with fruit. I'm, I'm kind of fruited out. All right, well, let's see you next week. Father, we thank you for your word. And we just pray, Lord, that you will keep blessing these studies in your word. That, Lord, you would um, pour your spirit upon us. That, Lord, as your people, we would fall madly in love with you once again. That, Lord, we wouldn't be acquaintances. That we wouldn't love you from a distance. But that, Lord, we would love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That everything we do is motivated by our love for you. And we just ask you to give us that work within us, that honeymoon love. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.